Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome to part two of my Tower Law video. Now, in the last video, I covered some of the basics, but I did not yet talk about one of the most important parts about the Tau, namely the justification they keep whispering to themselves at night to convince themselves they are not living in Stalin's Rose Garden, namely the greater good. Now. It's a pretty uncomplicated philosophy that puts the needs of the group ahead of the needs and rights of the individual. A bit of an extreme view on a collectivism, really. And to begin with, that doesn't sound so bad. Maximum happiness for the maximum amount of people, right? So, and by the way, these following words are in no way a middle finger to a certain blog post written by a certain fellow over at CA, because... You see, here's the problem. When the needs of the many trump the needs and rights of the individual, for example things like equality and freedom go straight out the window. Something like free speech can only be tolerated if it is in support of the main group's argument. Um, <laughs> deleting comments. <coughs> Sorry, uh, got a little thing stuck in my throat there. It is essentially the idea of collectivism taken to the extreme in the form of a dictatorial government that not only persecutes, but flat out brainwashes the population to all agree and comply with the collective ideology. Now, the Tao do this in a very nice, non-intrusive, and therefore non-confrontational way. It is essentially a perfect Ogliarchal collectivism state where everything is done for the greater good, and the greater good is decided by the leader caste, or the inner party, if you wish. And since all Tao are indoctrinated, slash brainwashed, to not only accept but believe fully in this system from birth, there is virtually no pushback from the general population, despite the apparent lack of freedom. This changes somewhat when we start looking at the other species of the Tau Empire, the Krut, the Vespid, the Nikasar, and the human defectors known as the Gravesa, which translates into the wonderfully fascist sounding human helper. Most importantly, the integrated species are allowed to retain their individual faiths and philosophical beliefs as long as they do not interfere directly with the idea of the greater good. This appears immediately to contradict the idea of an ogliarchal collective, especially as the other races are not affected by the ethereals to anywhere close to the same degree as the tower. However, this is a bit of a misleading problem, as the new races are only allowed to truly keep those traditions and faiths that the inner party, the ethereals, deem relatively harmless. All other ideals, etc., are eroded via a frankly ingenious process where newly compliant worlds are settled by large numbers of Tau or already properly indoctrinated members of the other member species preferably members of the same species that is currently being indoctrinated. To begin with, this appears to be merely the expected influx of workers required to bring the planetary properly into the Tau Empire, and their primary work lies in improving the lives of the population via new and wondrous Tau technology and culture. And while doing this, anyone interested in helping are of course welcomed with open arms and included in the workforce. A usually very well-paying and privileged position. These new workers are then spread out across the workforce so that they are surrounded by those that believe in the idea of the greater good and so will of course teach the curious newcomer about this wonderful and all-inclusive philosophy. As you might imagine, the idea of the greater good might seem very interesting. After all, all those who contribute towards it have a meaningful and valued place within Tao society. Everyone matters in the eyes of the Tao, and so many of these new workers find themselves converted, and those that can't be converted are simply let go once their assigned task is complete. 
No clear repercussions or punishment is ever handed out. But this is of course just the first step. After the basic upgrade to the planet is complete, the Tau and their followers, both new and old, start removing themselves from the other people of the planet. They build their own towns and cities, start their own businesses and schools, etc. And slowly, often over the course of generations, these Tau collectives and shops get better treatment. For example, um, oh, we have to build a bigger and better hospital here because there are so many people living here. Or, oh, we need to give this contract to this company because they have newer trucks delivered from Tao itself. And so, slowly but surely, the other people start thinking that, hey, maybe I should apply for a job over at uh, that new shop. The Tao bosses are always nice and they pay really well. Especially now that my old workplace has a really hard time finding work for truckers like myself. More and more of the populace come to the appreciation of the greater good. Until the point where the Tau populace outnumber the previous populace. And then things start accelerating very, very quickly. Soon, special laws will be enforced on the impoverished parts of the population to keep them safe. They are no longer allowed to gather in large groups, for example, and again, to combat the rising poverty in the other settlements, small numbers of people from those places are selected to come live in the bigger and better Tau collectives, and well... If you were used to living in a shack and was now given a luxury apartment, odds are you're going to be pretty damn ready to hear whatever your new and ever so gracious hosts have to say, after all. It would only be polite, would it not? And then, finally, to combat the crime and the poverty in certain places on the planet, birth rates have to be controlled. Only those that the Tau deem mentally and physically capable are allowed to have children, and of course, believing in the greater good is a sign of a solid mental and physical health, and hey, who knows, maybe the new child will be given the option of Tau or normal citizenry. Who knows what the child, or you know, his legal our guardians might choose. The child's guardians would, of course, have to move with the child to a brand new house in a Tau city and be given jobs, of course, all for the best of the child, naturally. If, of course, he should choose to become a citizen of the Tau Empire. So, you can see it's all very peaceful and very nice and friendly, but the end result is always the same. A nice, happy world where everyone has a place. And only that place. Well, always is a strong word. Usually it might be more appropriate. There are worlds within the Tau Empire where considerable parts of the population are none too happy with the new Blueberry Overlords, and even some that have taken active resistances against them. However, while the Tau try wherever possible to appear as gentle and benevolent masters, that does not mean that they are unwilling or incapable of violently suppressing dissent. They just prefer not to, because it's simply easier. When it's required though, they usually do it in a very low-key, small teams of fire warrior crisis to suit teams, raiding known and suspected points of resistance activity in a quick and brutally direct fashion before leaving the scene as quickly as they came, and then using the local media to cover it up. They do this because the Tau Empire is spread thin enough as it is. They need to deal with any hint of resistance as quickly and decisively as possible with as little public fuss as possible, because a full-scale revolt would require considerable resources and, more importantly, time to get under control. And time and resources the Tau do not have. Any such sign of weakness could be potentially fatal as the Imperium really, really wants to take back some of the territory they have lost to the Tau over the recent years and would be 
more than happy to help liberate any oppressed populations. To summarize, the point I'm trying to get across is that the Imperium is most definitively not a nice place to live in for the vast majority of people, and while the lives of the Gweoessa may at first appear immeasurably superior, it does come at a cost. The Tao Empire is not evil, neither is the Imperium. But neither are either of them good. As with most things in 40k, it is all shades of grey. Or darkish blue. Having had a good little rant on that subject, let us proceed to another interesting question. The Tao Empire, despite its technological advantages, is an insignificant gnat next to the Imperium of Man when it comes to military power. The military strength could at best be described as wet noodle level when we're talking about war on a galactic, or in other words, imperial scale. Now, I'm not saying this just because I'm an imperial fanboy and I consider the ass-faced smurfs to be filthy pulse rifle spamming pond scum of little more worth than a busted testicle, although all of those things are true, mind you. I say it because the Tau Empire is very, very small, and in a galaxy of this size, being this small is hazardous. For example, when the Turnid Splinter Fleet of the much larger Turnid High Fleet Behemoth invaded Tau space, the Smurfs panicked hard and lost several worlds in Turnid advance, even choosing to completely evacuate several colonial worlds completely. By Imperial standards, the so-called High Fleet Gorgon was a trivial thing that could have been left up to local sector command. To the Tau, however, this was the scariest shit they had ever seen, and in many ways it was the final wake-up call their leaders had been dreading for quite some time. After realising just how dangerous the Imperium was, they had for a long time suspected that there might be even worse things out there in the galaxy, but so far they had seen very little of it and had uh, dared to hope that maybe the Imperium was the worst of it. The Tyranids, however, shattered that illusion quite comprehensively. Despite that, though, the Tau Empire still thinks itself relatively safe. After all, they dealt with the Tyranids, and what could possibly be worse than a small splinter fleet of Tyranids, right? And so they are currently focusing on consolidating their current worlds and integrating those few worlds they have yet to conquer within their home turf. This is all in preparations to continue their campaign against the Imperium, and they have begun in a limited manner with what is known as the Third Sphere Expansion. Now, their initial expansion, the Second Sphere Expansion, was halted quite abruptly after some initial success, and I think that deserves a special mention before we begin on the events of the Second Sphere expansion, however, I would like to go over some basics on the Tau army. As mentioned previously, the Tau are not well equipped from nature's side for close combat, and most of their gear also revolves around improving their long-range effectiveness. As such, the Tau need to be, and are, a highly mobile force. On the point of their gear, though, the standard issue Tau infantry armor is leagues ahead of that used by virtually all Imperial Guard's troops, and consists of three layers of protection. The outermost layer is the armor itself, and is made out of a hard nano-crystalline metal veneer that is bonded to an inner layer of high-performance thermoset molecular polyethylene. This is essentially a fancy way of saying light metal with a shock-absorbent layer of cast plastic underneath. But the 40k way of saying it sounds way more posh. The second layer of defense comes in the form of an energy-absorbent padding used to counteract the kinetic energy of getting shot and thereby minimize the blunt trauma. And finally, a one-piece suit made out of densely woven fibers, a la Kevlar, to provide full body protection. 
All this gives the Fire Warrior fantastic protection against standard hard round ballistic weaponry and knives, as well as being chemically treated to be resistant to flames and most irritant chemicals or gases. Lastly, the Tau have one extra large and thick piece of armour strapped to their left shoulder. This is used both as extra protection for the warrior's face and upper body when kneeling to fire, and also as a melee shield. Unfortunately for the Tau, however, most of their present and major enemies use weapons that are considerably more dangerous than ye old pistol, and while it offers protection roughly similar to that of Guard's Carapace Armor, although more covering against LAS weaponry and fragmentation weapons, it is virtually worthless against Bolter Ammunition or Tyranid Claws. Although on that note, it should be mentioned that it offered virtually complete protection against the lighter versions of gaunt carried Tyranid bioweapons. Of course, this meant relatively little in the end, as the Tyranids simply started churning out more gaunts armed with good old claws and fangs. More importantly than the armour itself, though, is the helmet. In the case of the distinctive Dome Tower Combat Helmet, Protection is at best a secondary function. Its primary purpose is to house a wide variety of systems and sensory gear, including a radio, night vision, rangefinder, visual relay system, and direct access to the main command network for heightened situational awareness. All of this gives the Tau Infantry Soldier a considerable advantage over an Imperial Guardsman at range, however, the helmet is also meant to focus the warrior's vision and is supposed to be an aiming tool and is not made for sudden changes in focus or direction and so further hampers the Tau in close quarters combat. The same design principles can be found in the standard Tau infantry weapon as well, the Pulse Rifle. This weapon is an advanced version of Imperial Plasma weaponry and uses an induction field to contain and then propel microscopic bursts of plasma at extreme speeds. This gives the weapon not only fantastic range and accuracy, but a damage potential that far outstrips that of virtually any other race in 40k, with the exception of the Necrons, of course a race that the Tau are, as of yet, virtually, completely, and blissfully ignorant of. The power of the weapon does come with one drawback, though, as pulse weapons fire considerably slower than, for example, bolters or las weapons, and can be quite bulky. Although they also come in a carbine variant and a pistol variant, although these are usually reserved for officers and the specialized scouts, the so named um, Pathfinders of the Tau Army. There is also a rare variant called the Longshot Pulse Rifle, which, as the name suggests, is a designated long range sniper rifle. This rifle requires absurd amounts of work to produce, however, and is as such quite a rare weapon. Reserved for. Um, Towels of distinguished rank and skill. Now, from the looks of these weapons, it quickly becomes obvious that they were not designed with flexibility in mind. They are long range position tools that are ill suited to the brutal realities of hand to hand combat. The Tau also don't like bayonets, and in most cases, Tau warriors are armed only with small knives at best, and often not even that. In fact, whatever melee weapon the Tau do possess are usually used as ritual tools or in a highly ritualized single combat between Taus, and is a woefully lacking blade when used in a brawling melee, as most Tau enemies are not known to comply with the rules of Tau on a combat. The Tau themselves, though, don't really see this as all that big a deal, as they mentioned, will do everything within their power to avoid that kind of combat. And in general, if Fire Warriors find themselves locked in hand to hand combat with their enemies, then something has already gone horribly tit up wrong. 
Especially as most Tau Fire Warriors don't carry any form of dedicated close combat weapon, as mentioned previously. But hold on, you might now say. Looking at all of the art in this video, there appears to be quite a few Taus with knives. Surely that counts as a melee weapon. Well, again, like I mentioned previously, not quite. That is a so-called bonding knife. It is used in a ritual called Ta Lizera, where uh, members of the same squad are bonded together through ritualistic cutting of their flesh. And the knife that was used for this is then carried by the group's leader wherever he may go, including battle. And the knife is not, in any way, shape or form, meant for actual combat use. The Tali Sera is perhaps the most sacred of tower rituals and represents an unbreakable bond between brothers and sisters in arms, and the knife is a symbol of that bond. As such, Risking it in a fight is probably the absolute last resort, as uh, doing so essentially means that the Tao puts his honour on the line, and not just that, but the honour of the group on the line, for the merely inconsequential thing that is a single Tao's life. To avoid this uncomfortable situation, the Tau utilize two basic strategies, the Mont Ka, the Killing Blow, and the Kayun, the Patient Hunter. The Killing Blow is essentially a version of the German World War II idea of Schwerpunkt, or Focus Point, where the Tau Kader seeks to break through the enemy's lines at its weakest point and then proceed to try and surround the enemy so that they can be mopped up later. This tactic can be best likened to the German idea of a Vernichtungsschlacht, or Battle of Annihilation, where the goal is to destroy the enemy quickly in one single decisive battle via the use of superior maneuverability and firepower. This type of warfare is ideally suited to Tau's virtually completely mechanized army and lets them to control the flow of the battle from beginning to end. The Patient Hunter, on the other hand, is an idea that has more in common with guerrilla warfare. Here, the extremely mobile Tau forces prepare a series of ambush sites along likely routes of advance, and then wait for the enemy to wander into their carefully laid out firing fields. Once the element of surprise is lost, the Tau retreat onto their transports and speed off to the next ambush site, and so on, and so on, and so on. Essentially, the tactic attempts to not only bleed the enemy via repeated attacks, but also to frustrate him into giving chase to the Tau transports, thereby diluting the enemy's main attack. In most cases, minor variations of these two main principles are sufficient to deal with most opponents, even if the Tau are severely outnumbered by their enemies. And it should also be mentioned that Tau Commanders are in no way bound to one or the other and can switch between these doctrines freely as the situation demands. It also helps that the Tau really don't care about holding ground. They will happily abandon even vitally important locations if staying would mean their defeat. They are capable of doing this due to the extremely mobile nature of the Tau army and the fact that practically all of their energy weapons are rechargeable. This allows the Tau force to stay mobile and in the field without resupply for much longer periods of time than virtually any other army. They also have considerably more freedom of movement than most armies as their anti-grav vehicles can cross rivers and even small ravines without the need for bridges. But, of course, these doctrines were developed to deal with enemies that, for lack of a better term, play by the rules. Enemies that have routes of advance and try to strike at logically valuable objectives. Enemies that can't see the bloody future, for example. Enemies that have lines that can be pierced and flanks that can be rolled up, or supply lines that can be disrupted. Now. If this can be a dangerously naive take on warfare in the 41st millennium. To take a relatively simple example, the Tau attempted to utilize the Kayun against the Space Wolves Great Company, with predictably catastrophic consequences as the wolves could smell the blueberries treated combat armor 
from kilometers away. Or another example involving Adeptus Astartes from the White Scars chapter. Now, granted, the Scars are always going to be a damn tough customer for the Tau regardless of if they play fair or not, as they are more than able to match the Tau in speed and maneuverability, and when it gets to a close range engagement, well... You can imagine how well that works out for the Smurfs. But on this particular occasion, the Scars were not playing fair. A Storm Seer by the name of Kaljuk used his powers of foresight to predict the movements of the Tau and maneuvered his brothers into position to launch an attack at the Tau at their most vulnerable. Again, the result of this engagement was predictable in the extreme. But in both of these cases, the Scars and the Wolves, you know, they might have cheated a bit, but at least both sides played roughly from the same rulebook. There are, however, races out there in the deep, dark corners of the galaxy that play the great game of war according to a completely different set of rules. For example, as I will get to later, the Tau have only encountered chaos once, and this one brief engagement resulted in the mutiny of one of the Tau Empire's greatest commanders. Let's just say that should a warp rift open up by central Tau, well, the results should be amusing in the extreme. But there is of course a better example available in the form of the uh, Hive Fleet, Gorgon. This was an enemy that ignored all the rules. The swarm has no flanks to roll up, no battle lines to pierce, no supply lines to attack, and the Tyranids could not give the faintest of farts about ambushes. The swarm will simply cover the whole goddamn continent as such, ambushing them is a little difficult. There is simply no direction in which the Tau could pull back that the Tyranids are not already heading in, and as such, you know, hit and run becomes a little bit problematic, and honestly, the Tyranids are only one of the races that just outright rewrite the rules. Imagine the Tau trying to fight the Necrons, or the Dark Eldar with ambushes, <laughs> or, or trying to create a breakthrough straight through a demon horde, not to mention Chaos Space Marines. The Tau still have a lot to learn of the universe, but that is also their greatest strength, as the Tau will no doubt meet these threats and no doubt be absolutely horrified, get their ass handed to them initially, and then they will adapt, and then they will fight back, because that's how Tau work. They are far, far more flexible than the Imperium, and therefore, they have a better chance in the long run of countering more unconventional forces that they have just encountered. But that's enough of that. I'll get into Tau vehicles and weaponry in greater detail at some point in the future, but for now, let's get back to the history, shall we? So, when the fledgling Tau Empire first encountered Imperials, they originally thought they had found some pretty damn easy pickings. A backwards, technologically inept species with very little in the way of military power. It took the Watercast diplomats a decade or so to realize that what they had found was merely the forgotten outcasts of an incomprehensibly vast interstellar empire that stretched across the entirety of the Milky Way galaxy. And remember, this was long before they ran into the Terranids so far, uh, the most potentially dangerous foe they had encountered were the Karut, and the sheer ridiculousness of the disparity of military strength between the Tau Empire and the Imperium was enough to make a grown Tau weep. It was quickly recognized by the Tau leader cast that any overt military action against the Imperium was pure and simple suicide, and yet the Tau's ambitions were far too large to be contained by their newfound borders, so they devised a plan to slowly infiltrate human society via trade and diplomatic talks. They began to build and nurture connections with the various human worlds, offering favorable trade and, in many cases, even gifts of technology and resources. They spent 
decades like this, slowly working themselves into positions within the um, courts, essentially, of planetary governors. In this way, they slowly but surely spread their diplomatic influence throughout dozens of human worlds, in some cases even establishing a military bases on said worlds to um, protect their trade. In fact, said trade became so blatant that alien goods and wares were being sold in the open with no attempt at subterfuge, despite this being a clear violation of Imperial law. Even so, after decades of carefully working their way into the human society, the Tower of Watergast was ready to do what the Firecast could not, namely claiming dozens of Imperial worlds in a single fell swoop without risking massive numbers of Tau lives. Finally, and long last, the rehearsed words of sedation and protection were finally whispered into the ears of Imperial governors all over the Tau frontier, and assured as they were not only of Tau protection, but even further increases in trade, wealth, and of course they can turn a considerable share of said wealth themselves. Many Imperial Governors threw off the oppressive shackles of a distant terror and joined hands with their new blue overlords. The Tau, true to their word, rushed in military forces to fortify these new worlds in anticipation of the expected hammer blow retaliation of the Imperium. As so, they hunkered down and waited. And waited. And waited. And waited, but nothing came. The Tau were celebrating, the Imperium had clearly seen reason. They had accepted these world's sovereign right to choose to leave the Imperium. Maybe there was some easy pickings here after all, and so they lived happily ever after. Or, well, for about a hundred years or so at least. You see, at this point, the Imperium had barely even noticed that the Tau were a thing. It took 100 years, an unusually quick response by Imperial standards, before the Imperium had formulated a response to the growth of the Tau Empire. In the year 742 of the Millennia 41, the Imperium had finally articulated a characteristically solid response uh, to the Tau in the form of the Damocles Gulf Crusade. This was a relatively small crusade by Imperial standards, centered around a dozen capital ships of the Imperial Navy, including a Retribution-class battleship, the Blade of Woe, and an Overlord-class battle cruiser, the Niobe. Alongside these ships came an unknown number of escorts, with the Imperial Guard forces consisting of 19 regiments of Imperial Guard, with the backbone of the Crusade being seven mechanized infantry regiments of Brimlock Dragoons. Little solid information exists on the other regiments, but we do know that at least one regiment of super heavy armor and one regiment of artillery was present alongside a regiment of elite stormtroopers. Alongside these regular forces came the Titan Legion Legio Thanataris, with an unknown number and class of Titans, and five provisional companies totaling circa 500 Adeptus Astartes, provided by the Iron Hands, the White Scars, the Subjugators, Nova Marines, Sites of the Emperor, Ultramarines, Black Templars, and Hammers of Dorn. Exact total numbers of the Crusading Force is unknown, as the size of regiments can vary greatly, but it seems safe to assume that the force numbered well into the millions. By Imperial standards, this was a fairly small and local crusade, the only really notable element of which was the Fist of Light, an Iron Hand strike cruiser under the command of Captain Ruben, the elected leader of the Adeptus Astartes elements of the Crusade. However, while the force was unremarkable by Imperial standards, representing but the tiniest fraction of the Imperium's might, it was still quite a shock to the Tau. After a hundred years, they had pretty much assumed that the Imperium had let the planets go. After all, this time was the point of sending such a monstrous force. 
Initially, attempts were made to communicate with the Crusade forces via proxies on the outlying worlds of Garrus and Kleinst, but predictably the Crusade force had no interest in dialogue and simply set about repacifying the worlds via rather brutal means of suppression, where all those implicated in dealing with the Tau were summarily executed. Now, this, as you might assume, made it pretty damn clear to the Tau that there would be no talking their way out of this one, and what followed was a classic example of Imperial warfare, where Tau worlds were simply cleansed of alien life via brutal genocidal ground campaigns or purgings via orbital bombardment. As was the case of the ice world of Vizel, where Imperial commanders decided that the planet held little immediate strategic value and so simply bombarded the Tau colonies from orbit. This utterly ruthless approach to warfare shocked and angered the Tau, and brought about the full realization of exactly what manner of beasts they were provoking. Up until now, the Tau had a fairly bright outlook on the galaxy, reasoning that they were the chosen people and that all others could surely be made to see the justice of their greater good. But with its systematic program of annihilation, the Imperium made it painfully obvious to the Tau that things weren't going to be quite so easy. To their credit, though, the higher Tau leadership remained calm and collected and began preparing countermeasures against the very real threat this invasion force presented. The first thing the Tau realized was that their navy could no longer fight a careful battle against Imperial forces. Up until this point, the Tau aircast commanders had been under orders to minimize or, if possibly, avoid damage entirely to their own vessels, as the Tau Empire was still small and relatively new, and as such they had very few dedicated warships at their disposal. And while it became clear that production of these vessels would have to be increased, this was of precious little help against the Crusade force already grinding its way into Tau space. This careful stratagem had been implemented at the first encounter between the Imperial Navy and the Tau forces at the Battle of Hydus, a um, Voidborn battle, which resulted in the loss of one out of seven Tau ships and uh, some pretty damn severe damage to the remaining six, in return for virtually no damage to the Crusading force. This was despite early advantages where Tau ships proved to have an overwhelming advantage in maneuverability and range of Imperial vessels. But when the Tau fleet began to maneuver to maintain the distance and so keep themselves relatively safe according to their doctrine, they severely underestimated the speed and toughness of Imperial ships, as a Space Marine strike cruiser and a squadron of sword-class frigates made it in amongst the Tau ships and proceeded to tear them apart with point-blank broadsides, something the Tau had virtually no defense against, as pretty much all of their weapons are centered in the front section of their ships, designed for long-range standoff engagements, not the broadside brawling of the Imperial Navy. It is, however, a testament to the skill of the Tau captains and admirals that only one ship was completely destroyed in this near catastrophe. The second realization the Tau came to was that they could quite easily outmaneuver Imperial ground forces, but that they also had to avoid close quarter combat at any cost. This was somewhat complicated, however, by the Imperium's clear advantage in numbers, and made even worse by Imperial void superiority that meant that they could land troops virtually anywhere at any time. Another nasty surprise came in the form of the Adeptus Astartes' abilities to use drop pods to strike deep into Tau controlled territory and even directly into Tau formations. This last option was one that the Tau themselves had dismissed as impossible, as there was simply no way troops could be dropped at the kind of speed that would be necessary to avoid the majority of AA fire without pulping the occupants, and if by some miracle anyone survived, 
they surely would be far too spread out and unorganized to offer any real resistance, and if by yet another miracle they could, there was no way they could also land heavy weapons required to deal with the almost completely mechanized tie of fire warriors. All these assumptions, however, were proven to be less than accurate during the Battle of Sielkel, a minor colony world of some 7 million Tau. Despite these early setbacks, though, the Tau adopted and came up with a few basic theories on how to defeat Imperial forces. Firstly, any void engagement should either be carried out with extreme care at extreme range, followed by an immediate and hasty retreat in a hit and run style, or the entirety of the available fleet had to be dedicated in one decisive pitched battle, where the primary tower objective would be to break apart the Imperial fleet's formation and then head straight for the transports and logistical ships. Reasoning that if these could be destroyed, then the Tau could concentrate on denying the rest of the Imperial fleet the opportunity to bombard Tau settlements directly. Bear in mind, though, at this point, this tactic was based on the fact that at this point in time, the Tau did not know just how, say, insane the Imperium could be. And so, they assumed that simply denying bombardment opportunities of important locations would be enough. They had yet to be subjugated to the ultimate middle finger, that is, exterminatus, something the Imperial Navy could unleash from any point on the planet, not just those the Tau considered important. Luckily for the Tau, though, this ultimate fuck you was not deemed necessary at any point during the Damocles Gulf Crusade. Back to the point, though, secondly, the Tau rightly assumed that the Imperium could be dragged into a long-term ground war, and so they could also, rightly assume, that the Imperium would struggle with supplying their troops so far from home. Now, on many occasions, this could very easily have been a fatal mistake to the Tau Empire, as their assumptions, while correct on a basic level, failed to take into account just how beyond and angry the Imperium can be. You see, the Tau were working under the assumption that if any crusade could be bogged down and bled on a single planet, then the wider Imperium would simply decide it was too much of a bother for too little gain and give up. And so, at Dalith Prime, after a failed attempt at destroying Imperial transport in the Void in accordance with Method 1, the Tau attempted Method 2. When the Imperial forces landed and began their advance towards Tau population centers at the Dalith Sept army, began pouring all available troops into the fence and eventually succeeded in halting the Imperial advance. The Tau used every trick in the book to disrupt and delay further Imperial attacks, but were eventually forced back. The idea was, though, that this army only had to hold the line until reinforcements from the rest of the Tau Empire could arrive and begin pouring in reinforcements. Events would, however, conspire towards quite a different end, with the Imperial forces withdrawing of their own volition to strengthen their defences against the newly emerged threat of the Tyranids. At the time, though, the Tau considered this a victory for their idea of drawn-out conflict, because while well, they had no idea that the Imperium was under attack by a bunch of alien space gribblies, little realising the bullet they had just dodged. As those amongst you who are familiar with the Imperium know that backing down from a fight is simply not how the Imperium works. In the end, though, the Tau Empire was still alive after its first brush with the Imperium, and though the Tau casualties probably stretched into the billions, most of which were civilians, mind you, the Tau had learned valuable lessons from this confrontation, and until further notice, they halted all expansions into Imperial space, realizing that they are far softer targets to conquer while they build up their capabilities. Perhaps of greater importance, though, was the realization that the galaxy was a far darker and more hostile place than what was originally assumed. And while some of the leading cast trumpeted this as a victory against the worst the galaxy had to offer, 
There were others that suspected quite rightly that this was uh, to be just the beginning. And for the Imperium, this came as an uncomfortable surprise. A highly organized and capable enemy had grown on the Imperium's borders. To make matters worse, it was blindingly obvious that this was an enemy that could only become stronger over time, and would already now require significant forces to deal with. Forces that an already pressured Imperium simply could not spare. Now, let's continue on to the present day. I have already mentioned Oshava, also known as Commander Farsight, briefly, but before he turned from the great to good, he was one of the finest Tau battle commanders, and he was assigned the task of reclaiming those worlds lost to the Imperium during the Crusade. These worlds were sparsely defended, as the Imperium had not really had any real bother with you know, reclaiming them properly, assuming that the Crusade would first just, you know, annihilate the Tau, instead of having to be recalled due to the Griblies, and so they were very sparsely defended, and had no real chance against these fresh Tau forces, and so Commander Farsight proceeded to take back all the worlds lost except one. Before the last world could be assaulted, he was waylaid by orcs, a species that Commander Farsight had a deeply personal dislike of, and so he argued that the orcs were clearly the greater threat here and turned his forces against the orcs rather than the last imperial world. This campaign eventually led the commander and his army to the abandoned world of Arthas Moloch, where the last orc mobiles had made his stand. It would appear that Oshava's campaign against the orcs were at an end. And so, in the style he was best known for, the commander deployed his troops in a bold assault on the last orcs, when something very, very uncomfortable happened. You see, this was to be the town's first and to date only proper encounter with Chaos Demons. In the ensuing fight, the ethereals assigned to the commander's expedition were all killed, and Oshava himself had been made privy to information he would rather not have known. For someone that had considered the uh, orcs to be the nastiest creatures in the galaxy, this was quite the shock meeting, you know, demons, and it made him question his leaders. After all, the ethereals were supposed to know everything, right? and they hadn't warned him or anyone else about these demonic creatures. Or their apparent odd magical powers. With this in mind, Oshava ignored his orders to return to Tau Space and instead founded the Fireside Enclave and assumed a fairly hostile stance towards the rest of the Tau Empire, although it should be noted said hostility appears to be directed solely towards the ethereal caste. Of course, the obvious question now is, didn't he decide this of his own free will after being released from whatever means of control the ethereals had over him? Or is he the first tower to be affected by chaos? Well, for the moment he appears to be a very quiet and peaceful by chaos worshipper standards, which would suggest the former, but it must also be remembered that the Tau have far less of an impact on the warp, and so it seems reasonable to assume that the reverse is also true. Oshava may already have been irrevocably tainted by chaos, but it just takes a lot longer for that taint to fully take root in a Tau than in, for example, a human. And this leads us to modern day, and the Tau third sphere expansion, where they are yet again pushing into Imperial space, and as of yet, the Imperium has not yet responded in force, as they have considerably gribblier things to deal with at the moment. It should be noted though that it took a century for the Imperium to respond last time, and then it did so with a small force against an unknown and assumedly weak enemy. I suspect that this is not a mistake the Imperium will make twice. Whatever happens though, the future of the Tau Empire could be interesting indeed, as this still young and naive yet extremely dynamic race ventures into the galaxy that has yet to reveal to them its true
true horrors on a truly Warhammer scale. And I, for one, can't wait to see what happens next. Until next time, I have been Arch. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope to see you soon. Have a good day.